Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Brown with the Office of Communications, and welcome to NASA headquarters. Today, you will hear the latest update on the largest and most capable robotic machine going to the surface of another planet. NASA's Mars Science Laboratory, otherwise known as MSL, scheduled to launch from the Florida Space Coast this month, and you'll hear the latest details on that. Information about this incredible mission is on www.nasa.gov slash MSL and the press kit that has all of the detailed information on the mission and all of the other logistics is at http colon slash slash go.nasa.gov slash MSL press kit, all one word. We'll have short presentations from our speakers, then we'll open it up for questions starting here in Washington, our NASA centers in the phone line. Before we get started, let me introduce you to today's speakers. First up, Doug McQuistian, Director, Mars Exploration Program, NASA Headquarters in Washington. Ashwin Vasavada, I'm sorry, Ashwin Vasavada, MSL, Deputy Project Scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Pasadena, California. And Pete Tysinger, MSL project manager, also at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And with that, I'll toss it to Doug to kick us off. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, boy, it's great to be here. Uh, it's a momentous occasion, but of course, uh, what's really important is, you know, the last time I sat at a press conference on MSL, it was to announce a slip. This is where we really want to be, and, and it's fantastic to be here. I am very proud to say that MSL has been assembled, tested, encapsulated, and stacked on top of the Atlas and is ready to go. 15 days to launch. Pretty incredible. It's not your father's rover. This is a 2,000 pound uh, machine that's over six feet tall. It's uh, truly, as Dwayne said, the largest and most complex piece of equipment ever placed on the surface of another planet. Truly a wonder in, in engineering. From Long Island to California, from New York to, uh, to Florida, we've employed thousands of people in very high-tech careers for the last six or seven years on this mission. And that's going to continue as we cruise to the planet and actually get to the surface and operate and do wonderful science. It's the best of U.S. imagination, the best of U.S. innovation. And we couldn't just do this alone. We have a lot of partners with us. We have France with us. We have Canada. We have Germany. We have Russia. And we have Spain. In the U.S., of course, to launch this, we have the United Launch Alliance and the Kennedy Space Center and the United States Air Force of Cape Canaveral. And, of course, we have the Department of Energy aboard. So it's, it's truly a spectacular mission with a lot of involvement worldwide. Can we have the first graphic, please? What you're looking at is a strategic, integrated program of Mars exploration. We began this program back in uh, two, roughly in 2000. You'll see the operator, operational missions there still include Odyssey and MRO. Of course, the, uh, the uh, rover Opportunity is still operating. Uh, we have a partnership on Mars Express. Phoenix, we flew in 2007. But MSL sits squarely in the middle of this strategic two-decade-long activity. And what it does is it bridges the gap from the past decade, scientifically, to the next decade, and technologically. Scientifically, from understanding the planet as being warmer and wetter than we had previously believed, to the next decade to try to understand if it was ever habitable and potentially even seeking signs of life, not life itself. It's not a life detection mission. Technologically, we move from airbag landings and, and small systems of a few kilograms of payload to much larger systems and putting that 2,000-pound rover on the surface. So MSL is pioneering the challenges of high technology. We have ever-increasing payloads. We've got more accurate landing capabilities. We've got longer live systems on the surface with nuclear power, and we have state-of-the-art instruments aboard. These are also techniques that are necessary as we move towards the ultimate goal of putting humans on the surface of Mars. An extremely exciting time for the Mars program and for NASA. This is the capstone of the year of the solar system. Uh, the science that we'll be doing that you'll hear about from Ashwan, we couldn't even dreamed of doing 10 years ago at this scale and technology as well. We've moved from Pathfinder to Spirit Opportunity to MSL, and you'll hear more about the technologies from Pete here shortly. Uh, but it's really pretty amazing how in a matter of 15 years we've gone this far. And again, we bridge the gap 
from follow the water to seeking the signs of life. We'll, we'll, we'll excite the nation, we'll inspire the nation. We're gonna show incredible new vistas, great new discoveries. But most important is the launch is just the beginning. We still have a little bit of cruise, but then the key is landing in August of next year. And that's gonna be exciting. It's very challenging, never done it this way before, but uh, you'll hear about that from Pete, but we're, we're just thrilled that we're at this point. So what I'm gonna do is turn it over to Ashwa and let him talk to you about the science. All right, so as a scientist on this project, I can tell you that this is a Mars scientist dream machine. Uh, we're so excited to have this rover go into Mars this year. Uh, it's going to be the virtual presence for over 200 scientists around the world to uh, explore Mars and Gale Crater that we'll talk about. Uh, this rover is not only the most technically capable rover ever sent to another planet, uh, but it's actually the most capable scientific explorer we've ever sent out. And so with that, you know, we're just super excited. Uh, it's about twice the size of previous rovers, has 10 very capable scientific instruments. And on the first graphic here, you can see uh, that uh, the rover, like previous rovers, is, uh, has six wheels. It is much bigger, though. It's about six feet tall. And uh, what really dominates the design of this rover is the fact that it has this ability to sample rocks and soils on Mars for the first time. And so it has a big six-foot robotic arm, and the rover is uh, partly that big because it holds two very capable scientific laboratories inside the rover. Uh, so the, one of the things that the rover does is to survey the landscape around Gale Crater. So it does that with some HD cameras. Uh, it also has um, uh, that eye on the, on the top of the rover, which uh, uh, shoots out a laser and can survey the chemical composition within 20 feet of the rover. Uh, then another thing we do is monitor the environment. Uh, so we have a very capable weather station for winds and pressure, humidity, that sort of thing. We can sound below the rover to figure out if there's any minerals that contain water below the rover. We also detect natural high energy radiation. Uh, this kind of radiation is critical to measure for the day that we do send humans to Mars. And in fact, this sensor is being flown by the human exploration part of NASA. Uh, on the next graphic, you'll see what really is the meat and potatoes of this mission. Uh, when we deploy that arm and we put out a whole bunch of sensors on rocks or soils that are of interest to the science team. Uh, we have some tools here where we look close up with a magnifying glass camera. Uh, we also have another sensor on the arm, which takes an even more detailed chemical look at the composition of the rocks and soils. But the, uh, you know, the crowning achievement uh, scientifically of this rover and technically is to uh, drill into rocks and capture material from the insides of rocks, which we've never done before on Mars. And that's really where the science will come from. And we drill in with a big jackhammer drill. We deliver that sample to the rover itself and analyze it with two very sophisticated instruments one of which measures the minerals that are in those rocks and soils, another which looks element by element uh, which chemical elements are there and looks for any organic material that might be present. Uh, so, but before we can do any of this uh, incredible science, uh, and, and really it wouldn't be worth doing if we didn't have a spectacular landing site as well. And so the next graphic uh, shows a, a really nice uh, image of the sun rising over Mars, and you can see the cratered southern highlands in the near uh, part of the picture the smooth plains in the far part, and right on that boundary, in the middle of the image here, there's a crater with a mountain inside of it. And that mountain inside the crater is what caught the eye of the scientists that have been studying Mars for the last decade and resulted in being chosen for this mission. Uh, if you go to the next graphic, you'll see that Gale Crater is about 100 miles across. Uh, that yellow ellipse is where we will land uh, Curiosity, and then we'll drive towards the mound. The mound itself is over three miles high. And on the next graphic, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about why this mound is so spectacular scientifically. Uh, it's actually composed of layered rock, and we see that from the orbiters that are around Mars now mapping the planet. We've discovered that the layers are flat, which means probably sediment at one point filled the entire crater, and now it's been stripped away. But even more uh, interestingly, uh, the layers are made up of different material. Uh, the bottom layers are a mixture of clays and sulfates, then you go into layers that are just sulfate salts. And then you get into some upper layers, which are just, frankly, uninteresting Martian dust. Uh, and it's that change over time, which the whole planet has experienced. But what's incredible about Gale is it's all in one place here. Probably the entire early history of Mars is here for us to, to drive out of that ellipse over several months and then start climbing this mountain with curiosity. So we couldn't be more excited about that. Uh, and before we do any of this, we got to get there. And so that's what uh, Pete Tyson will talk, talk with you about. 
Thank you, Ashwin. Um, as, uh, as Doug mentioned, we are in Florida. Uh, we are uh, prepared to, uh, on the vehicle and prepared to go. I want to show some pictures of the, uh, the buildup of the vehicle. Um, uh, when you land on Mars, when you go to land on Mars, what you're really talking about is three vehicles, not just one. Um, there is the vehicle that gets you to Mars. Um, uh, there is the vehicle that actually penetrates the atmosphere and goes through the entry, descent, and landing portion of the, of the mission. And then there is the rover that eventually gets deposited on the surface. And I'll show you some pictures of how we build up that vehicle in, in that way. Uh, on this, uh, in the first graphic is the, uh, is the rover itself. Uh, it, you can see, uh, it's a, as Ashwin mentioned, it's a six-wheel, what we call rocker bogey system. You can see the arm on the left with a turret assembly, which has a, a several of the science instruments. And uh, you can just barely make out in this photograph the mast above. Uh, uh, as uh, Doug mentioned, it's about 900 kilograms, uh, roughly 2,000 pounds. If I could have the next graphic, please. Um, as, I'm, as Doug mentioned, this requires a new and novel system in order to get to Mars. We're not landing uh, like Murr uh, did on, uh, on the uh, airbags. We are landing propulsive like Phoenix, but we're landing a rover, and it's not a stationary lander. And so what you see on the graphic is the descent stage that we use to propulsively lower the rover and the uh, and itself to the surface of Mars. Uh, you can see the eight large main landing engines and then off to the right uh, that large uh, kind of surfboard shaped picture uh, feature is the landing radar which you use to measure the velocity that we land at and the altitude both very critical uh, for this particular landing system. If I could have the next graphic please. Uh, this shows the rover underneath that descent stage uh, you can see the, uh, the reddish uh, uh, elements are uh, protective covers around the main landing engines. They're used when we put assembling things so that they don't get damaged. And you can see that the composite of that, the descent stage for the rover, is being put up inside the, the, the back shell. Uh, that's the top half of the entry uh, of the entry vehicle. If I could have the next graphic, please. Uh, and now you see that, that that assemblage is now up inside the white back shell, and below it is the heat shield. Uh, looks very much like an Apollo entry capsule, except in fact it is larger than an Apollo entry capsule. It is about four and a half meters across at the bottom. If I could have the next graphic. Um, this is the entire vehicle that goes to Mars. Uh, the um, the uh, part at the top, which has the white um, circumferential uh, banding, is, uh, is the crew stage. That is all the equipment that we need to get to Mars, but we don't need at Mars. It includes telecommunications equipment the solar rays for the interplanetary uh, transverse, and, uh, and the propulsion system to do the uh, trajectory connection maneuvers in order to get us navigated to the right place for entry. When we launch, this is actually uh, upside down. We actually launch with the heat shield up and the crew stage down on top of the atlas. Next, please. And here you can see kind of the last picture of the vehicle, as we could see it as a total vehicle before it was encapsulated in the fairing. That shows the atlas fairing. Uh, which is then put around the vehicle, and then the fairing plus the vehicle is transported uh, to the uh, vehicle uh, integration facility at the launch pad. If I can see the next graphic, please. This shows the vehicle inside the fairing being lifted to the uh, top of the uh, of the Atlas. I think that occurred on the on the second of November. Uh, and if I can see the next graphic, please. Uh, that shows the assembled vehicle as it currently ha is. We're going through final launch vehicle uh, operations, and we're going through final 